Hello, and thanks for joining us today. I'm really glad you could be here. So today we're talking about custom software development. Man, there's so many ways that this can help your business level up. And today we're going to decode many of them to help you take advantage of what software development can do custom in your business and be able to help you grow faster and maybe even easier. So with us today is Ryan Vice. Now he's the co-founder and CEO of Vice Software, which provides cost-effective web development services. Now after gaining 20 years of experience in shipping software, six years in building high-velocity development teams and publishing two books, acting as a lead architect for countless projects and being awarded Microsoft's MVP award three times, Ryan decided to transfer his skills to an entrepreneurial space. Now, Vice Software doesn't operate like most development companies. Instead, they utilize modern toolkits and globally distributed team to bring clients impressive design at a very reasonably price point. And the unique structure of his team allows Ryan to remain very hands-on, helping to create architectural patterns, processes, and best practices that maximize velocity and ROI. So over the last three years, Ryan has led Vice Software to 50% year-over-year growth as the team grew from 15 to 45. Ryan, thanks for joining me today. Hey, thanks for having me. And uh, I probably need to trim down the intro. No, that's okay, man. That's good. You got you, you got so many yeah. impressive things. You probably cut nine out of 10 of them out. And now we're just left with the one out of 10 anyways. Yeah, I wish it was true. But yeah, <laughs> no, so it's great listen, to be on. What um what kind of custom software development do you guys do? And what kind of custom what is custom software development? Let's just start there. Like what what kind of things are possible for entrepreneurs with custom software development? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's definitely a point of uh, confusion for a lot of folks. Um probably the easiest way to kind of codify it is it, a lot of people think like, oh, I need to get a website. Um, there's a lot of different things that a website can be, and uh, only a few of them would require custom software. So um, if you think about what a website would be in the world without technology, uh, it could be a business card. Um, it could be a marketing brochure. Uh, it could be an answering machine. Um, all of those things are not custom software. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, that's just kind of, there's website templates out there and, and platforms like WordPress and Joomla and things like that you can use for that. However, if your, um, your website requires uh, more of a description around, oh, it needs to do some calculations or it's managing these business processes, um, that kind of stuff. It, it, it's actually a tool that does things. Um, then that's where custom software might fit in. And then that stays consistent kind of um, across whether it's a web app, a mobile app, um, some kind of backend service, whatever you need. Generally speaking, <clears throat> if what you're doing is um, a fairly common thing, uh, it, it's probably not a... Um, Probably not a great fit for custom software. Someone might sell it to you, but <laughs> uh, it's not a, a great purchase. <laughs> so when do you think the time is right for business owners to kind of look into this as a solution? So I did an article. I, I contribute to Forbes. And my first article was around this topic because I think it is a valuable thing for business owners. Uh, it, it's called Build Versus Buy. And basically the heuristic I provide in there is that... Um, Every business has a lot of things that they do that are not uh, special. They're not differentiators. Uh, we all, you know, most likely do something with invoices and count receivables. Um, we're communicating with our staff, um, you know, reaching out to customers, et cetera. All of that stuff, um, you could probably throw a rock from where I'm at in Austin and hit, it, <laughs> hit a SaaS company who's written the platform for it. Uh, so you can go out there and get some economies of scales on that stuff and get yourself a good tool to solve that problem. Um, now, most business owners, though, when you talk to them or executives, they're not going to talk about those kind of uh, mundane things that their business do. They're going to talk about the differentiators, the things that make them special. Um, and that's where you might find that custom software can help you shine a little brighter and make you be a little bit more competitive, whether it's, you know, a system that, uh, you know, makes it to where you don't have to spend as much money training your staff because it's more opinionated to exactly what you do, uh, let you reach more customers, uh, save more money. Um, pull in more revenue, whatever it is. Um, one of the examples I give is uh, there's a company in Austin that um, Yetis are super popular down here. So there's a company that'll power, powder coat your Yetis and put your logo on it and things like that. And so the software that they use to kind of uh, let customers do that experience, they would probably benefit from doing something custom there on their uh, manufacturing floor, the software they use to kind of make the sh machines do what they do. They might benefit with some custom software there, but for all the other things like counting and finance and invoices, uh, you probably just go off the shelf. 
solve the shell for a lot of that. But when you need something really specific, it might make sense to make more custom. Do you think it makes more sense to build something from scratch? Or do you oftentimes work with something that already exists and modify it to fit somebody's needs? Um, that's kind of a it depends situation. Um, so for example, if you're doing something around like uh, kind of sales management, uh, you might want to take a platform like Salesforce and then get some Salesforce engineers to come in and customize that for you. Th there are some trade-offs around that stuff. Um, uh, once what you're doing gets too specialized uh, or if it's really complex, you might have cost advantages to building from scratch. Um, and part of the reason is sometimes these um, these platforms that you can extend, the consultants who work on them are pretty high dollar. <laughs> you know what I mean? So <laughs> the most expensive part of uh, technology projects is definitely the folks uh, writing the code <laughs> and just the whole the whole team that works on it. So um, like I'm in an entrepreneur organization and one of the guys um, in there was saying like, I was saying, man, it must be so stressful, you know, if you make a mistake and you're building things like out of like physical, uh, you know, boards and concrete and all that, you know, I was like, with us, we just delete the code. And he was like, hell no, it's not. He's like, our labor is way cheaper than yours and two by fours are cheap, you know? And he's like, so we make a mistake, we just redo it, you know? Um, software is not like that, you know? It's very, very um, the labor is super expensive. Sure. Is that where you've kind of found your niche is being able to work worldwide with a force to bring costs down? Yeah, so our focus has been on affordability. Um, my partner and I met when I was doing a lot of that stuff you were talking about in the intro. Uh, that that had me managing teams offshore in India. Um, all of the large companies at that time saw like a lot of opportunity in that market, and none of the small and mid-sized companies were taking advantage of it. And when I first found myself managing teams in India, it was really um, frustrating. And if you had those support calls where you've gotten really frustrated and felt embarrassed after you probably understand what it'd be like if you had 30 people you're trying to manage, uh, you know, from a wholly different country and time zone and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so when Prashant and I, who's my partner, when we first started working together, we actually saw the model working really well. And we realized, okay, uh, smaller companies don't do this uh, because it's too expensive to do it well. Um, one of the analogies I use for my business a lot, I got a, a landscaping project done <laughs> at, one, at my old house. And uh, yeah, I, I realized, I was like, wait, this guy's business is just like my business because like he showed up and uh, the guy who came in and helped me figure out the design of our landscaping was clearly from somewhere around Texas, had a nice big truck and like, you know, understood like culturally what needs to happen in a backyard in Texas. It's like, oh, you need your barbecue pit area over here. You got some dogs, you want a dog run and all that kind of stuff, you know? Um, but when it came time to actually like dig the holes and do all the other stuff, it was a different set of folks that came in to do that work from a different labor market, you know? Um, and if I was paying 20 guys that were driving the nice truck to do that, it would be a much more expensive job, you know, but really we just needed that skill set in the very beginning, just to kind of help me figure out what I need and how to do it. And we needed that person to have the right uh, relationships and connections. Um, and so that's basically what Prashant and I do. Uh, you really need someone like me in the States who's really technical and can talk to stakeholders, understands the business side of uh, technology and all of that, working with a trusted partner in, um, in whatever region you're going to, but we're out of uh, New Delhi. And um, you can really take advantage of the, um, there's well-known negative attributes, but there's also some really positive attributes. Uh, and so with our team, we're able to, um, we're able to kind of build the team where we approach software more like a factory approach and like a team-based approach. In the States, it's a lot more craft-based approaches to software. So basically everyone is banging on metal until it looks like a sword. And uh, it's a very kind of uh, fulfilling craft kind of thing that's being done, which sometimes you want that and you want to see the, um, the fingerprints of the craftsman on your work. But for a lot of times, you know, you're looking for something more like a Honda or something like that, that you just need to get back and forth to the store with. Um, and so that's where we come in. Uh, there's a lot of things that are common in software that are well established on how you do them. And we've created a team that focuses very heavily on doing those things quickly. Uh, and we do it from um, a market that's much more affordable than in the States. So that's how we do it. We have a few other aspects to it, but that's, uh, that's kind of the, one of the big ones. So give me some examples of where you guys have done what you've done to help businesses. Like give me some case studies per se. So everybody listening and watching can get an idea of different ways that kind of software can be customized to help them grow their business. 
Yeah, so as far as there's two aspects to it, there's the transformative aspect and there's the cost saving aspect. So I could give a quick example of each. So the first time that we saw our model really work and we're excited about it was with a company called Ticket City here in Austin. Uh, Ticket City is a company that resells uh, tickets to sporting and uh, music events and things like that. And um, they, <clears throat> obviously, if you have something like that, having an app would be advantageous. You know, you can message people like that. And so they had hired a uh, developer to build an app for them. And when you're building mobile apps, you actually have to have different teams for iOS and Android um, or Apple or iPhone and Android. Uh, it's entirely different skill sets. I mean, you can't use one guy in the other place. And then if you have a bigger project, you have double um, management, double QA, uh, double bug fix costs. It's just really um, an inefficient model at this time, especially. Um, so we came in with our team, which has the affordability qualities that I had already mentioned. And then on another pillar of, we have four pillars of, um, of affordable software. And one of the other pillars is uh, tools. So we try to pick strategic tools. So we've aligned around one of Facebook's tools called React, which allows you to write uh, an app that can be installed on the phone, but as the, the same technology you would use for a web page, and then you can build it for both of the mobile apps uh, for the both of the phones with uh, with one code base. So um, we were able to take what took them with a regular uh, iOS engineer, took two years, an iOS engineer in the States at that time with benefits and everything, you're spending about 125 a year. So they spent about half a grand to get an Apple's uh, app in the store. Uh, we turned around and rewrote the app. In all fairness, uh, over those two years, they would have been doing a lot of iterating on their product and stuff like that. So I'm not trying to say this is completely apples to apples, but we rewrote it in about six weeks for about 50K. <laughs> and that was with a lot of my time because it was the first time we did a React project. If we had done it as our second project, it probably would have been about 35K. Uh, and we were able to reuse a lot of their existing stuff, et cetera. And then they had iOS and Android or Apple and Android. So we were able to take this business who wasn't really able to engage your customers as well as they wanted to. And they were missing out on the whole Android market with their app, kind of rewrite everything and give them both apps. Um, so that, that's one way the model benefits folks. The other thing, we're working with a company here in Austin right now uh, called Urgent Care. Urgent Care recently was just a, um, what do you call them? Urgent Care Clinic, where you can just go and you pop in and pop out or whatever. Um, and um, they are now, after one year, uh, kind of a, more of a technology company. Um, and, and this is not something that we came to them with the vision or whatever, but the uh, CTO is a guy named Alan. And um, he's a buddy of mine and he got this job and contacted us. I was like, look, they want to get into telemedicine and try and, um, and try and take what they do and make it available in the schools so that, you know, if a kid gets sick uh, or someone's child gets sick at school, we can just have the doctor kind of pop up on a screen and we can see him at the school and it doesn't disrupt the whole day and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so that's where it kind of started. Um, and, and since then um, they're in, I don't want to say it wrong, but I think it's like uh, a lot of the schools in Texas, maybe it's like 60 or something like that. Um, and they're building all kinds of tools to modernize these schools. Uh, and like I said, it feels like I met, I had lunch with the CTO um, last Friday and I was like, man, it feels like your company is more of a tech company now than uh, I'm sure they still do those stuff. He's like, yeah, it's, it's really, it's transformed the whole business. I just kind of opened up a whole new avenue for them. Um, so that's kind of, two different ways it can go. And it's also a great example of the custom software versus the non-custom stuff. Um, if you're trying to make it so that uh, people who aren't like working in public schools and things like that, nurses can jump in and get it so that students can see doctors and get into the queue across all the schools and all that kind of stuff. Um, there's not probably gonna be something off the shelf that's gonna provide a great experience where you, you'll have a really successful outcome, you know? But we were able to design a system that's really obvious what they need to do. And it really kind of simplifies it. So, uh, so you can have those folks doing those tasks successfully. What do you think before you even start something like this? I mean, what are the keys to success for somebody that hires you to think about or to process uh, before, or, you know, before they actually get started? So that's actually my next article I'm writing for Forbes is um, what to look, uh, what to look out for when you're, when you're trying to hire uh a consulting team and we're also looking at whether you want to hire internal or whether you want to go with a team um there's a few factors to look at if if you don't have anyone on your team who's technical um then you're going to be beholden to your partner so that's that's kind of a big thing to think about there 
Um, but on the flip side, if you're in the US and you're, if you're not a technology person and you're trying to build a technology team, it's a pretty heavy lift, you know? So I think it kind of depends on how mission critical what you're doing is on, um, on whether you want to hire internal, whether you want to get an agency or some combination. Um, likely you, you might want to have some combination. Um, and then where the other piece comes in is if you are actually going to get an agency to come in and help you out with some of the stuff, um, there's, in my opinion, um, the success ratio with that is really low. And there's some really common red flags to look out for, which are, are honestly kind of common sense stuff, like too good to be true type things. So just like anything else, if you're shopping for contractors in your house, if you take the lowest offer, you're probably not, you're going to really be throwing the dice a little bit. If you go with the company that, you know, has the top ratings on Google and is the first result, you're probably not going to get the best deal. You know what I mean? Um, and so it's kind of a similar game with uh, custom software. And so what we usually tell folks is there's a few red flags. Um, watch out for contracts that are too good to be true. If you're getting money back guarantees and all this kind of stuff. One thing about uh, software is once you start doing business with someone, it's really hard to stop. It's not like, uh, you know, hiring waiters to work in your restaurant or something. You can just replace them. Um, <laughs> software is most of the time a liability. We claim we create asset <laughs> software. Uh, but the way we define that is if another team can't come in and take over the software really easily, then you have a liability on your hands because um, there's a maintenance cost to it and no one else can come in and you're kind of tied to this one company. Um, so before you get in with someone, what's more interesting to me than seeing these contracts that give you all these assurances is that you want to see um, kind of proven track records, but also very mature processes. You want them to show you this is why it works. You know, like I could show you what our full life cycle is from I, um, us talking about your initial idea all the way to pushing it out to customers and say, these, these are all the pieces that we do. By the way, these are what our estimates look like. When you look at the estimate, it should look like someone worked on it a lot and that they've thought a lot about how to create estimates. If you just get an estimate, it's just a slight, you know, number. <laughs> and they say, don't worry, uh, you know, give us half up front and the other half at the end. And, it, you know, you don't have to pay us until it's done and you're happy. They probably, you know, are just throwing the dice on that stuff and, you know, uh, some of the projects they make and some of the projects they don't and um, they just know that you're stuck with them, you know, so <laughs> it's a scary thing to get into, honestly. Do you think it makes sense to work with it based on your experience? It seems like it makes sense to work with companies that both have an, uh, uh, an uh, onshore and offshore team to be able to make cost effect to be able to make it cost effective. We find the hybrid model works really well. Um, and it's not because like, um, you know, people in one place are, are smarter or, or whatever. It, it's just because um, time zone overlap is important for a lot of roles. Uh, and then uh, culture, like a cultural understanding is important. Um, and there's just certain ways that the different teams or the different areas uh, communicate because of cultural things. Um, and so it's nice to have someone who can help bridge those things. Um, for example, my team um, in India is really hesitant about pushing back uh, against clients in the U.S. Uh, it's just how they, you know, how they operate. They're very, um, very polite, very gracious people. Uh, and so it's nice to have folks like me and Ray, uh, who does our product ownership here, and Cody, who does the design to kind of go into the conversations we're about technical design or, or business requirements and things like that. I just really kind of be able to feel comfortable pushing back on people and saying, well, you know, maybe that's not the best solution. You should maybe do something like this. And, and I think part of that is also that um, the way that that uh, message is received is a little different as well. When the folks are from the same, same area, uh, uh, even though it shouldn't be, a lot of that stuff plays into it, you know? Um, so if, if I deliver the same message, that someone on my team does, uh, for some reason, it, it goes a little smoother when I do it for some things, you know, it's just a quirk. What about building an app? When, when does somebody know that it's the right time to build an app for their company? Um, so one of the, one of the things we see, um, if you're, if you're an older company, um, and you've got a few folks at your company that if, um, you know, they were on a plane together and, Unfortunately, you know, something happens to that plane and your business would be in trouble. Um, sometimes that scenario can lend itself to having um, some software. Uh, usually if that's the case, um, 
those folks will have a lot of the knowledge of how your company runs in their head, and they'll be doing a lot of manual processes to keep your company going. So there'll be a lot of reliance on spreadsheets, uh, emails, and just kind of tribal knowledge. It's like, oh, okay, yeah, we take these invoices and we can take them down to Jeff and put them on him. Oh, and if he forgets about it, you go back on Tuesday and you remind, like all of that kind of stuff. And so if you're kind of a business owner or a department leader or whatever, and you find that you have these, uh, these folks that have all that really key knowledge to you, um, there's one type of business uh, or applications called these line of business systems. You can take that and put it into a custom system um, that understands your business. And then um, you can basically hire anyone to kind of, uh, or you have a much wider set of folks you could hire to, to kind of do those jobs because the, the knowledge about your business, the asset value of your business is no longer in the heads of the employees. It's kind of moved over into an asset that you own. So that's, that's one business case. Um, another one is, you know, if you, um, if you're not in the mobile space and, and you're, you want to engage better with your customers, um, that could be one, um, one of our clients we're in Texas. And so, you know, folks like their guns down here and we help a company called silencer shop for a number of years now. And the first project we did with them was a mobile app that, pardon me, helps folks get their paperwork, uh, sorted out for, um, for buying suppressors for sports, uh, shooting. Like competitive sports shooting, um, it makes it easier to get through that process. So it'll show you where the kiosks are around town. Where's the nearest one where I can do my paperwork? And oh, I can check in and see where my paperwork is. I can take pictures of it. Um, and so that particular app was not something that they made any money off of. It was just something that made uh, made it, their customers' lives easier um, and made it easier for folks to buy their products. You know what I'm saying? So. Um, kind of a strategic play there and then you know the more obvious stuff is uh, you know i've got the next billion dollar uh SaaS platform or social app uh, idea um we don't do as many of those as, as we do the other stuff um the billions or bust stuff is um it, those projects tend to be a little um the success ratio is so low on those and you know we commit to folks all the way through so we'll usually if someone's you know wanting to build the next billion dollar app will want to kind of have a help them bet a little bit on their marketing and go to market and pivot and all that kind of stuff. Cause um, you know, it's, it's never fun to be on the sinking ship, you know? What are the other things to think about when building an app? Because you just mentioned some examples of things I never would have thought about if I was creating an app for that company, like all the things that they built in that you built in with paperwork and finding locations so do you really have to have a clear objective before I approach you and know what I want? Or is it a matter of coming to you and saying, hey, look, I want an app for my company. I think it makes sense, but I'm not sure what it should do. Yeah, we can help people whiteboard it. Um, we partner, <laughs> pardon me again. We partner with an agency here in Austin who shares our values called Brand Cave. Um, and we've never hired and tried to build up the product side of our org because um, they do such a fantastic job. And the, the CEO is a good friend of mine. His name's Cody. We share values. Um, and so basically what we do is we do a, um, uh, a discovery piece with Cody. And, and we've done, there's a process called waterfall, which is falling out of fashion, but we think there's some really valuable aspects to it. And a lot of consulting companies, <laughs> pardon me, that I've talked to still use it. And basically what we've done is a really lean waterfall process where we'll take you through two phases of discovery. The first phase takes about usually five to 10 hours of Grand Cave's time. Uh, their time is really affordable. It's like $75 an hour or something like that. And so uh, that first phase, they will, um, Cody will work with you for two to three hours through your ideas. And then he'll come up with what's called a user flow diagram. The user flow diagram will show for every type of user that will use your system someone who's authenticated and logged in, someone who's not authenticated, someone who's administrator, someone who's a manager, you know, whatever the roles are, where they can go in the app and what they can do just as a flow chart. And so he's able to create those really quickly. If you're actually here in Austin, you can go to his office and he has a screen on the wall and he'll do it in front of you. It's really impressive. Um, and that'll get from kind of this idea that's in your head where you're like, yeah, and then it'll do this and it'll do that. And it solves these problems do something more tangible that me and my partner can look at and say, oh, okay, yeah, that's, um, that looks like about a four or five month project or whatever. And then from there, uh, Cody will take uh, his team and another, spend another 20 to 40 hours 
um, giving you what's called mock-ups, which are gonna basically be like architectural rending, renderings if you're buying a custom home. That's gonna allow you to see exactly what it looks like, where everything's at. Um, once we get those, Prashant and I, um, uh, we can take a look at it and we can. that's where we come up with our predictable model. We're able to take that and create a really detailed estimate uh, Cody does his requirements in a way that we can line item it out. Everything's like estimated at like half a day, day, day and a half, that kind of thing. Um, and that's a waterfall process where you do this upfront design. But the reason why waterfall was not super popular or fell out of favor is because people were spending three to six months with teams of engineers doing this stuff. We do it for like two, three grand in a couple of weeks, you know, so it's, it's, it's a very lean process. Then you have a very clear blueprint of what you need to build exactly what needs to get done. We'll put all of that stuff into your ticket management system and then we can hand it off to our team um, and, and they can crank through it. Now, there's a newer process called Agile. And the reason why Agile comes out is because that thing I just described to you, uh, the design is gonna be wrong. <laughs> we know it's gonna be wrong uh, because what's gonna happen is when people start using the system, um, even the stakeholders, um, it's just not gonna be exactly what you thought you wanted or you, you thought about it wrong you start using it it feels wrong and you're like oh can i change this like this or i can i change that like that again with the custom home analogy when you're building your house you might get in it and be like oh this paint doesn't really look right you know you don't really know until you walk through the space so to speak so what we found is that the way we do it that initial design is about 80 to 90 percent accurate um and so you can use a process called agile which you do every two weeks you show the software to people and they try it out and then they give you a tight feedback loop. And then you take that in and you can kind of add new items to what you need to do to make sure that the product is kind of evolving as you go through it. Uh, so we'll pad our estimates by 20% for the iterations of Agile. We mark all of our tickets with MVP up front uh, so that anything new that comes in, we just mark it. We don't mark it as MVP. And then doing the math on that 20% is pretty easy. Um, and again, as you hear me talking about this, you're probably thinking, well, it sounds like you've done this before. Uh, and that's what I was kind of um, cautioning folks about in the beginning is when you're talking to a dev shop, that's what you want to hear is you want to hear people telling you about these are our processes and they make sense and they need to be very well thought out. Um, software development, especially in a predictable way, is extremely difficult. <laughs> Most of the teams I've worked with do not do it well. Uh, and if you go to these larger companies, um, at least all the ones I worked at, deadlines are never hit. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you got all these yeah. full-time employees, the deadlines are never hit. It always slips. It, uh, and it's, it's and the reason is because it's incredibly difficult and it's not like they're just going to fire all their team every time they miss a deadline. So after a while, it just becomes, you know, uh, you know, how do we, how do we get these people to hit the deadlines? Um, well, if you go into the consulting market, you have the advantage where uh, there's a financial motivation there. So you, you can, um, you can find some shops that can hit deadlines in my opinion. It's just, um, it should be obvious that they've hit a deadline before when you're talking to them. It's the best way to say it, you know? Makes sense. Ryan, um, great talk today. If anybody, where can everybody go that's watching and listening to be able to learn more about what's available when it comes to software development, custom software development, app development, all the stuff that you guys do? So we have a lot of blogs on our website about it. You can go there. It's by software.com. Um, if you, um, if you go there, there's a little pop-up that asks if you need any help. If, uh, if you have any questions, just feel free to uh, pop, uh, pop a message in there, and that comes straight to my phone. Um, if I'm busy, I'll, I'll kind of get back to you or whatever. Um, and I'm always happy to um, talk to kind of business owners and stakeholders and help them kind of navigate and brainstorm these things. Um, I spend a lot of time in organizations like Entrepreneur Organization and 7CTOs. Uh, and uh, software in general is all about sharing. And so um, I find that, you know, if business leaders get together and share a lot, we all do better. So that, that's kind of the philosophy. Awesome. Ryan, thanks for coming on with me today. Hey, I appreciate the invite. It was uh, really nice chatting with you. All right. So everybody, listen, if you, there's so many things that you can do here with custom web development, software uh, modernization, UX, UI, 
uh, so many things besides app development, custom software creation uh, that you could really use to be able to take your business to a whole other level, to give you a competitive advantage, to make it easier for your customers to work with you. If you'd like to learn more about all the possibilities here and how these tie in to your business and how to tap into all this and make it affordable for your business, then all you have to do is go to vicesoftware.com. That's vicesoftware.com. And at vicesoftware.com, there's a ton of stuff. There's a phenomenal blog. Um, as Ryan said, he's a contributor to uh, Forbes, right, Ryan? Forbes, correctly, yeah. Contributor to Forbes. So he writes a lot of articles that you're able to probably able to access from the website as well. Um, so there's blog, case studies, a lot of information about the different solutions that are available. So you can think about how these can be utilized to be able to grow your business. So make sure you visit vicesoftware.com. Thanks for tuning in. Have a great day.